empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You pour water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You pour water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be coconut water, my friend. All right, I'm playing around with Bruce Lee's quote a little bit there, but Bruce Lee, you can call it celebrity worship if you like. I don't care. He means a lot to me. He is a very important figure to me in my life and was part of my motivation in getting involved with martial arts. Aside from being a mixed martial arts fan, or fanatic really, to extend the full meaning of the word, that's what led me into Tiger Shulman's, which is where, at TSMMA, that I met my guest this week, Brandon the Mechanic Catino. The dragon, Bruce Lee, does come up in our conversation. He was an inspiration to millions of people. It really puts it into perspective to me that I am now older than he was when he died. He died at 32, and to think that someone at such a young age made such an impression on the world at large, he left such a legacy of the many things that I admire about Bruce Lee. The thing that I wish to emulate most is I wish I had a fraction of his discipline. The mind-body connection, I don't really distinguish there. The physical and the mental are completely connected, so you can see how strong he was in his mind, which led to him having a strong body as well. All of this is part of the reason how I ended up in martial arts in the first place. I think the ship has sailed for Tiger Shulman's and myself, unfortunately, but I wish that I could, as he said, empty your mind. I'm looking for that stillness, that peacefulness. I can't seem to ever stop thinking. I can't seem to turn it off. And I did study a little Tai Chi a couple years ago before my dad died. And that definitely helped in my training, but I need to get back to that. But aside from just being a fan of the sport, I always advocate martial arts or martial art type training to people because I'd always explain the benefits as threefold. For one, you're learning a skill. In this case, you're learning a martial art. By doing that, two, you learn how to defend yourself, which everybody should, especially women. And three, by doing all of this, one of the side effects is you get in great shape. And I love whenever anybody gets off of the couch and picks up some weights or gets on a machine or whatever it is. But trust me, if you put on a pair of gloves and you start hitting pads or mitts or whatever, you're not going to regret it. But it takes a lot of discipline to become a black belt like my guest this week. And remember, there is another saying, and I'm going to have a lot of sayings from the martial arts world. But one of them is, what's the difference between a black belt and the average person? The average person doesn't become a black belt. My guest has, and I hope you enjoy our talk. We talk about how he started off as a pro wrestling fan, got into martial arts, became a pro kickboxer, and more. So let's have a few words with the mechanic, Brandon Catino. You've got a nice set of knuckles. stands six foot one inch tall he fights at 155 pounds at the lightweight level he's placed in third second and first in the north american grappling association beginner and intermediate divisions in those tournaments along with the good fight submissions only tournament he's also placed in the warriors cup muay thai kickboxing tournament He's the USKA middleweight Muay Thai and leg kick champion. He has an 11-6 amateur record in Muay Thai and kickboxing. And he's a first-degree black belt in Tiger Shulman's mixed martial arts. Also, one half of my favorite couple to watch UFCs with, he is Joshu Brandon Catino. Us Joshu. <laughs> I'm so glad to sit down with you, largely because I finally got here. You have the most labyrinthian 
development or neighborhood that I've ever been in. And I'm so glad that it was at least daytime as opposed to the last time where I was coming around. You remember we were watching, was it Bound for Glory? Yes, it was. And Jonathan and I were trying to find our way around at night and it was disaster and joshu fonda says the same thing i don't know if anybody else has a problem oh, yes. finding this place <laughs> yes everybody all our friends that usually come here they usually always at least the first time they always have trouble finding it here they usually park like behind and we always gotta tell them no you can just park in the front but <laughs> well that's how it goes at least we're finally here and when i walked in you were watching the latest edition of nxt uh, yes. samoa joe and Eric Young were the main event, and right before that was an Austin Aries interview, and Bobby Roode is showing up. So basically, it's NXTNA at this point, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe, you know, saying TNA isn't doing what they're supposed to do, you know, the talent's going to leave and go elsewhere, you know? Well, well, since we just started on the pro wrestling thing, because uh, I know you're a wrestling fan too, How'd you get into pro wrestling? Was that before martial arts or after? Uh, before, like, you, you know, like usually most wrestling fans, you know, you start out as a kid. Uh, I probably want to say I was these four, four or five, you know, watching, uh, was it the main event, you know, Saturdays or superstars on Saturday at the time, you know, watching uh, Hulk Hogan, you know, the ultimate warrior. Uh, and then, you know, watching pay-per-views here and there. And uh, just been a fan uh, ever since. Do you find this with a lot of MMA fighters. You hear sometimes, like BJ Penn will mention, like, come on, get up like Hulk Hogan. And there is a cross-section over there at various points throughout its history in different countries, too. Do you find that a lot of MMA fans are wrestling fans, too, or at least were when they were younger? Or is it the more like, oh, that's the fake stuff? Uh, I kind of want to say it's the it's the first one. It's where you know most of us are fans, because usually every kid... I don't care what they say, probably was a wrestling fan at one point in their life. And then as they got older, they just got away. To me, everybody was a fan once in their life, even even if they deny it. Do you like certain people I know <laughs> behind us. <laughs> Joe Shu's wife, Carissa, is over here joining us. And we're usually getting together to watch UFCs at Tilt a Kilt or wherever. And a lot of wrestling fans may have gotten their first glimpses from uh, back in the day in the Attitude Era, of course, Ken Shamrock, mm -hmm. and later on Brock Lesnar. In Japan, it's uh, much more muddy water. And now we're still waiting on CM Punk's debut. And every time UFC specifically, but also Bellator with Bobby Lashley and Kurt Angle making appearances and things like that, you think there's going to be uh, a whole flood of new fans coming in to the sport of MMA. And I know there was a term years ago, graduating, when someone would basically get too old for wrestling and they wanted something more real and yeah. mature and whatever, and then they go over to MMA. But it seems to me that, yes, when Brock was fighting, he would do huge numbers on pay-per-view. That's why they signed CM Punk to do the same thing. But it seems to me that every wave of wrestling fans tuning over to check out their guy fighting doesn't really stick around, per se. Am I wrong in that? I kind of want to say yes and no, because I think really what it is, it's, you're right, it's like, that's their guy. They're tuning into MMA to watch, at their time, their favorite wrestler, or to see how this wrestler does in this new adventure. Some people, maybe at the time, they might get hooked and be like, oh, I like it. Or some people are just like, that's not for me, I'm just tuning in for this person. It's the same thing as in Ronda Rousey. She gets the casual woman, right. you know? Like I tell you, when we go out to watch the fights, if it's Ronda Rousey, I see a lot of women out there. I'm like, where did they come from? Right. And then when she's not fighting, I don't see I don't see that many women. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where it's like, they're just there to support that one person. Mm -hmm. If they're not involved, they don't care about it. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with Conor McGregor as well. You know, he's big. Irish are coming out for him. But if there's no other Irishman on there, they're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Brazilians as well. You know, if Anderson Silva or Vitor or your, you know, Big Nog, Ludenog is fighting, they're going to be out there to support. But they're not on there, then they're not really showing up. And where do you think the crossover comes into play? Because I, rem I, I used to say this for years, and I did on the roundtable, that when I was a kid and I'd go to the library, because that was before YouTube and DVDs yep. and all that other stuff, that the category would be boxing and wrestling when you're looking up pro wrestling books or whatever yep. in the, the library. And I figured at some point it's going to be 
boxing, wrestling, and MMA. So obviously they're all combat sports, wrestling being the scripted one out of it, but it's the same sort of concept. That's what I would always try to get through to people who told me, oh, it's apples and oranges. And in many respects, obviously, yes. But at the end of the day, the story is it's one person fighting another person for a belt, and that's the concept. Do you think that there is a big crossover from pro wrestling into martial arts and vice versa? Um, it depends on the person. It can be because I am a fan of combat sports, which means I watch boxing, I watch MMA, I watch kickboxing, I, I like wrestling. But then there are just people who are just certain fans of that one thing. Like, for instance, like you've had you've had to talk about boxing and MMA fans, how they don't go together. Like old boxing heads don't watch MMA. Right. They, they stay in their lane. Same thing with MMA fans. They don't cross over and, and watch boxing, even though boxing has been around for so many years. We've had all these great boxers and everything like that. And everybody wants to compare how wh- which one is better than the other. But... Somebody like me and rest of combat sports fans, you know, like a like a Jimmy Smith from the commentator for Bellator, he'll say himself, you know, he's a combat sports fan. He likes to watch this combat, you know, doesn't matter what it is. Or Mauro Renaro. Yeah, like, exactly. He's all over everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With us, we're all wrestling fans, boxing fans, kickboxing, and we'll watch it all because it's just combat sports that we love. While some people, like I say, they just watch certain things. You know, it's the same thing like with me in, in regular sports. Like I'll watch football, I'll watch hockey. You know, those are my two main ones. Basketball, I watch here and there. And then baseball, I'm not really watching unless somebody says, hey, want to go to a baseball game? And I'll be sure I'll go check it out because at least it's live. I don't have to watch it on TV Mm -hmm. where I might doze off on my couch. When Dana White had his catchphrase, basically, or his tagline, his selling point for years that everybody loves a fight. Everyone's going to tune in for a fight. And when wrestling fans will be like, I like my storylines and gimmicks and characters and this and that. Yes, but... I think back to specifically the Brawl for All, Mm -hmm. which is notorious in the wrestling circles, like it was supposed to be a disaster and this and that. But I was actually there for two fights. The first Raw at the Meadowlands. Now it was was the IZOD. I think IZOD shut down, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah. Well, back then it was the Continental Airlines Arena. Yep. And this was uh, 98. And there were two Brawl for Alls. And I think there was a knockout. Now, up until then, the wrestling fans booed and they were chanting, boring, we want wrestling, this and that. But all of a sudden, there's a knockout and they pop. Everyone's yep. on their feet for that. So that is the element, I think, that is the, the common thread there, that adrenaline rush of living vicariously through somebody, projecting you onto the screen, whether it's a wrestler, boxer, fighter, getting the big knockout, making the big comeback, the underdog, whatever it might be. I think that's the common thread through everything. So how did you go from being a pro wrestling fan as a kid? How'd you get into martial arts? Was it around the same time? Uh, Yes. Uh, Like I said, the same thing. I was young. One of my uncles actually did martial arts, while my other uncle, he was the one who actually introduced me to... uh, to Bruce Lee movies, you know, mm. so I got to watch Into the Dragon, Bloodsport, all these other different types of martial art movies. So he had me, he got me watching while my other uncle did martial arts and he actually showed me moves here and there. What style did he do? I'm not really sure. Uh, I think he did karate though. I think it was karate. Like on a Saturday afternoon, I would go hang out with him. He would show me little moves here and there. Um, and then my other uncle, like I said, he was one who just had me, he just had me watching, watching the movies. And then I just was on my mom about, you know, this, I want to do it. I want to do it. You know? And then one day when we finally moved out of, uh, Nork where, where I'm originally from, and then we moved here to the Middlesex County area and like Saraville, that's when I, I, she finally had me try out of school and I stayed with it ever since. My mother was born in Newark. All right. Cool. <laughs> A lot of good theaters in Newark. No, yes. like NJ Pack and, uh, State Theater. Well, that's on the way to Newark, never yeah. mind. But, but how old were you when you started? Eight years old, mm-hmm. July 27th, 1993. I remember, I remember the exact date. <laughs> was this Tiger Shulman's? Yes, it was. And back then it was TSK, correct? Yes, it was Tiger Shulman's karate at the time, yep. So how different was it than what you do now? Man. <laughs> were you a Tiger Cub? No, I was not a Tiger. <laughs> I know, I was not a Tiger Cub. We had forms. We actually had weapon forms as well, too, where we got to learn how to use nunchucks. We got to learn how to use a bow staff. Of course, you know, we still had our kickboxing and we had our little bit of jujitsu, but we weren't as in depth in jujitsu as, as we are now. Right. I mean, the story with Tiger Shulman's is that when 
the original UFCs were starting up in late 93 and early 94 that Tiger Shulman himself saw this burgeoning sport and decided that we need to adapt to the times because uh, what was it last year or two years ago was the 30th anniversary? Uh, yes, it was last year, uh, 2015. Okay. So it was TSK before that, and you mentioned forms. Was that katas? Yes. Yeah. So it was a very more traditional karate style with board breaking, mm -hmm. I assume. And yep, we had board breaking. Yep. Yeah, and the gi tops and bowing and all the traditional martial arts tenants and everything. But when did it become TS Mixed Martial Arts, TS MMA? <sighs> It's crazy. I love how people ask me this. To be honest with you, I don't exactly know because the thing is when it happened, I actually was away for college. Where'd you uh, go to college? Uh, Johnson & Wells in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. Um, I didn't come back until like 2007. So I want to say between 2004 and 2006 is probably when they, they maybe made, made the change. Because that's when I came back. I was like, oh, all right. Tiger Showman's mixed martial arts now. Okay. But I understood the change and everything like that. So I, it, it didn't like bother me or anything. I was like, hey, I'm still training. <laughs> so it wasn't so much of a culture shock to you. Um, no, it wasn't. Did you follow the UFC or MMA as it was growing? Uh, yes, I got big into mixed martial arts or the UFC was really like how most of the new UFC uh, fans were was through the uh, Ultimate Fighter. Mm -hmm. You know, boom, I'm watching Monday Night Raw. Boom, right after Raw, here comes the Ultimate Fighter. <laughs> so I just stayed on Spike TV at the time, and I just watched it the whole way through. And I was like, oh, I like this show. There's the crossover again. Yep, exactly. <laughs> How much of an adjustment was it for you? Uh, I assume when it became TSMMA, there's no more katas and board breaking and the traditional karate. Yeah, yeah. So Master Tiger Showman was really just thinking to himself, we teach people how to defend themselves. So what's the best way or the practical most way to defend yourself. And it's really just to focus on just our kickboxing and our close range defense or jujitsu. You know, forms isn't really gonna help somebody, you know, defend themselves against, a, uh, against an attacker. A lot of that uh, traditional karate stems from hundreds of years ago yep. from monks defending themselves against invaders in China. So a lot of that is supposed to defend in theory, against spears and yes. other sort of, let's say, outdated weaponry. Yes. So it doesn't quite apply to the scenario that everyone has of being down a dark alley yep. and someone attacking you in 2016, does it? No, you know, so I'm saying and that's why that's why he got rid of, you know, the, the forms and it's just like, all right, we're just going to focus on these main aspects so this way people can defend themselves in in any situation, you know, that, that comes. When I said earlier that you were a black belt in TSMMA, so it's basically the Tiger Shulman's mixed martial arts style that mm -hmm. you were a black belt in. Yes, yes, because there are different styles. Like, say, you know, you have Taekwondo, you have Kung Fu, you have Karate, you know, you have black belts in Jiu Jitsu. Uh, but yeah, but I'm a black belt in the Tiger Shulman style. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I'd always try to explain it to people is that as MMA evolved, because initially it was a gimmick of the UFC. It was just, let's put a sumo against a boxer. Let's put karate against a taekwondo guy yep. and see what happens. As MMA started evolving, Jeff Blatnick uh, started calling it hybrid fighting. And eventually it became known as mixed martial arts. And as it evolved, I like to describe it as MMA kind of became its own style. I think as it is today, where... You won't see so many people like we used to back in the day. In fact, back in the day, it was called the the the, the exotics. Yeah. Do you remember that? Like, this guy's a gung fu expert. It's one of the exotic styles. But now, the way I like to describe it is it's an amalgamation. There's two forms that it really borrows from. Uh, for stand-up, it's kickboxing and Muay Thai kickboxing. And on grappling on the ground, it's wrestling and jujitsu. So in other words... Uh, that's the MMA style. It's a little bit of each, whereas you're not necessarily going to find someone who's a complete expert in all of them. Like Alistair Overeem's a kickboxing champion. Nate Diaz is a black belt in BJJ or yep. Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and this and that. But if you're just going to be an MMA fighter, you don't see that as much as we used to, where Ronda Rousey's a medalist in uh, Olympic judo, yep. this and that. It's like a little bit of each style. Is that an accurate description of what MMA or maybe even TSMMA might be? 
MMA, like fighters, that's usually how it is uh, because, like I say, they're, they're jumping into it. Certain days they're doing their boxing. Certain days they're doing their grappling or wrestling practice, what, you know, whatever it is. But the thing is, too, though, MMA is whatever you want it to be because, like I like to tell people, mixed martial arts is basically just taking two, sty- two styles of martial arts, putting them together. So mm-hmm. like you say, like, for instance, like, like a BJ Penn. He's a boxer and he does jujitsu. So those are his two mixed martial arts right there. You don't see him really throwing kicks that much. Right. And you're not seeing him do any takedowns on anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's not really working his wrestling. He just does jujitsu and he does boxing. But then you look at Uriah Faber. He boxes and he wrestles. Those are his two martial arts that he puts together. Then there are some people who go on who maybe add that third, like uh, like a GSP, you know, George St. Pierre. He's a freak athlete. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, ha- he, he, like say, when he first started, he, he was a karate person. Right. And that was really it. But then he started working his jujitsu while hanging out with Henzo Gracie, you know, and everything like that. And then also, too, he started working his wrestling as well, especially with the uh, Canadian Olympic team. So that made, so that made him evolve to a higher level than most people because most people were only using two while he was adding that, 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 that third one in there. You know, you got guys from Russia, like a, a Fedor. In Russia, Sambo's a big style there, you know? So they're using Sambo, and then they're using whatever whatever else that they want to add on to it. I always describe it to people as an open-ended sport, because when it comes to mixed martial arts, like you were saying, one day you might train this, one day you might train that, but it's so complex, because each one of these martial arts is a whole world in and of itself. So yes. combining them all together, like, wow. You And you mentioned GSP. And how he never wrestled in high school or college or anything like that, but he got his wrestling so good, he was training with the Olympic team in Canada. Yep. But not even just that. I remember before the Josh Koshtek fight, and he went to train with Freddie Roach, and all of a sudden he's boxing Koshtek yep. the whole time, and he looked pretty good doing it. So yeah, you can do it specialized. And when I say open-ended, I mean, for instance, if you have somebody like a uh, Kung Lee, where he's got a very specific style, uh, the Sanchu, of kickboxing, and you could tell that. Well, if it works for you, go ahead and use it. And that's the beautiful part of the sport to me. I don't know about you, and I'm sure you analyze it as much as I do, but every weekend that there's an event, I watch as much as I can, and I almost every time see something new. And I've been watching forever. <laughs> yeah. For like us who are really into it and the analysts, like I say we watch fights to look for something new, you know, to see how some people are moving. Like I'm a big fan of Dominic Cruz. I like I like the way how he moves. You know, his movement is different than everybody else. King Mo sometimes, you know, he moves he moves differently too for for himself being a light heavyweight. Like I remember him, I think at the time it was the time where him I think Rashad Evans, they were talking about this like Cuban style where I think it was like you were mixing boxing and wrestling together, but it was a certain way on how you like chained it together. And that made it like a Cuban style, I guess, uh, you know, and so that so that kind of got me going to see how they were working and see if maybe that's something that I could use one day, you know, when I when I'm training. When did you become a black belt? (laughs) Actually, I got it on my birthday in 1997. Wow. How old were you? Uh, I turned 13 that year. Okay, great. So how long did it take you? I know you took a break uh, for college. So how long together did it take you to get to that level? Uh, to get my black belt? Actually, because uh, I was a kid, 93, 94. I want to say four years. Okay. Yeah, four years, but it took me four times to test for it, though. What's the test like? Uh, well, it's different now than what I did. Because like I said, we have, with Tiger Showmans, they have uh, evolved and they changed some things up. So, like I said, at the time when I was doing it, we were still doing, you know, the the forms and the wood breaking and everything like that. So I had to I had to go through that, and then you know why I did my rounds of sparring and everything like that. Everything is different for everybody. Okay. Well, how did you go from being a black belt? And obviously, you hear all the time when you get your black belt, the journey's just beginning. For those who might not know, I think every martial arts style the belt system's different as far as the colors go yes but they all start with white and end with black correct yes and the idea is that you wore that white belt so much and you put so much blood sweat and tears and grime into it on the mat that it turned the dark color from all the the dirt essentially yes and that's the same premise in all the belt systems but you hear often you get your black belt obviously it took a lot of work to get there but your journey's just beginning. Now, obviously, there's different degrees of black belts and this and that, but how did you go from that to being an instructor as you are now? 
<laughs> you know what is the craziest thing? So like I said, I had went away for college and then like I came back and I started working, you know, you know, the real world, as they say, you know, normal, like nine to five type of job. What were you doing? Direct sales, Papa John's, the New York Yankees. I was selling their like extra inventory that they had. So like stuff that like they didn't use. Oh, so they couldn't give food to starving people yeah. in Africa. They yeah. had to sell it off to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so stuff like that. So we would kind of make make it a deal for people to use where they could get like buy one, get ones and or free or free stuff you know somehow to help just get rid of that or you know or like for the yankees we had like a whole bunch of tickets i used to work in cherry hill and then they transferred me to the lodi office which was right next to hackensack and there was a tiger showman's in hackensack and it was like right across the street so one day i think i got off of work early and i just went in there and i actually knew the sensei that was there sensei bop i actually knew her from growing up as a kid when we were both training in the, in the middletown uh, location and we just started talking and then she was talking about training again so I started to do that and then I think one night I was leaving and she was having her Joshu programs basically with people who do want to be instructors sit down with them afterwards and go over like teaching class and how to do and everything like that and I was kind of really just joking about it and I just looked at her and I just said oh hey when can I get a binder like that and then she just said next week come on in that was it and then I just came to the class and the craziest thing is like, I was the last one to join that class, but I was the first one to become a Joshua out of that whole group. Wow. I ended up training and working at Tiger Shulman's on a lark too. My dad and I were trying to build a fire pit in our backyard and I had uh, been getting the itch to get more active and learn a martial art. I didn't know if I wanted to do something more traditional because that was a little more rare, not what I was used to seeing all the time anymore mm -hmm. uh, with the way UFC blew up. So I was just trying to find something in the area. And we went to the Marlboro Plaza to that Home Depot over there yep. uh, to get all the bricks that we were going to lay down for our fire pit, which we enjoyed for about a year before he died. Mm. And right in that same plaza was Tiger Shulman's MMA. And I remember they bought an ad during a Bellator that I was watching. And it was a special holiday offer, this and that. So I called and I guess the rest is somewhat history, but also how I ended up being the temporary manager over at Old Bridge, because at this point, the Marlboro School had closed. Uh, your wife, Carissa, texted me out of nowhere. I think it was uh, a December or January. Joshu's looking for a temporary manager, this and that. So you <laughs> ended up... Uh, doing a lot of stuff. I, did we ever spar? No, never did. I didn't did. think so. We no. rolled a, a, once or twice, yes. didn't we? Yes, yeah. we did grapple once or okay. twice. How was I? <laughs> uh, I want to say, I think at the time, you were a blue belt. Yeah. Yes, you were a blue belt. But yeah, you were fine. You yeah. were fine. You were all over me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, just, I'm just there just to roll, you know, have some fun. Well, you mentioned the Joshu classes. And what is the hierarchy in the Tiger Shulman system? I know it's Senpai, Joshu, and where does it go from there? And what do those words mean? <laughs> the way how it used to be. It used to be Senpai, Joshu, Adeshi, and then a Sensei. But the Deshi uh, is no more because really a Deshi and a Joshu was kind of really the same thing. So they kind of just got rid of Deshi and it's now just Senpai, Joshu, and Sensei. I'm sorry, they're Shihan too. Isn't oh yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. And after and after a Sensei is is a is a Shihan. A Senpai means older brother or older sister because in reality, uh, you are the older brother, or older sister to somebody who just started training. So, because you're a black belt, so it means you've been there longer than everybody else. So, it doesn't matter of age or anything like that. In in the martial arts world, you are older than them, so you have more knowledge that you can help them with. So all these ranks are for black belts yes. to varying degrees. Okay. So Sampai means older brother or older sister. Uh, Joshu just means instructor. And then a sensei means senior instructor or born before. And then a Shihan is just a grandmaster. Okay. So Shihan Shulman, Tiger Shulman, mm. is he the only Shihan? No, he is not. We... <laughs> To see, there's Master Tiger Shulman, who's a Xi'an. Then there's his brother, Xi'an Shulman. Then we have Xi'an Heldman out of Florida headquarters, which is in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Simpson, who's in the Allentown School. Gravina. Um, Gravina was a, a, a sensei last I knew of. Yes, is that different? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, he just got promoted a while okay. back. Uh, so, and then there's uh, Xi'an Torelli, who's in the Yonkers School. 
Shion got high for two, so that's seven. So we have seven Shions now in the organization. So we went from having four to now having seven. Okay. So you've been a Joshu for how long? Uh, since 2008 is when I became a Joshu. And when do you go from that to being a sensei? That's up to uh, Master Tiger Showman. Whenever he thinks that I'm ready for that rank, that's when he will he'll he'll say that I've earned it. What's your relationship like with him? <laughs> you know what? It ha it has actually uh, grown over the years. It's definitely gotten. Uh, I guess you could say closer because like it definitely has gotten closer. Like, you know, he, he sends me texts, texts here and there. He calls me up sometimes just to check up on me, especially now, too, since, you know, I'm now a pro fighter. You know, our definitely relationship has definitely gotten closer because now he's more into definitely watching me and talking to me about my next moves and everything like that and what I need to do to better myself as a martial artist, but also too to better myself as an as an instructor as well. So me and him, we have I would at least want to say we probably at least talk like face to face, probably at least once a week. He definitely looks out for me. Like I say, you know, he looks out for me, you know, I'm fighting wise, but also too he looks out for me as, as my future as well. Cause he wants to make sure that, you know, after my fighting career is over, that I'm you know teaching or that I have my own school. You know stuff like that. So, we, so we talk about th things, things like that. I remember seeing him often whenever the Tiger Shulman's fighters would be walking out to the octagon and uh, things like that. He was always uh, in the corner. How many fighters does Tiger Shulman's have on its fight team, so to speak? Ooh, that number I can, I could not tell you. It's a good amount of people. That's all I can say. Like um, pro wise, I could tell you. Amateur wise. That's where I couldn't tell you because we have a lot of amateurs uh, coming up, you know. But pro-wise, I could tell you all the pros that are on the fight team. But the amateurs, I couldn't. Uh, pros, though, of course, there's myself. Then there's uh, Lyman Good, of course, you know, who's in the UFC. Uh, Jimmy Rivera, who also, too, is in the UFC. Uh, Nick Pace, who was once in the UFC, but he's now the current CFFC Bantamweight champion. Uh, then we have Louis Galdino, also a former uh, UFC uh, fighter, but who also is the current CFFC flyweight champion. And that's Cage Fury fighting championships. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, which they do shows in New Jersey and in uh, Pennsylvania. Mike Trezano, uh, the lone wolf, as I like to call him. Well, that's what everybody calls him, too. That's his nickname. Jenna Serio, she's, she, she, she's the lone female in the, for, for the pros, but hey, she represents still. Is and Muna Holland still with the organization? Muna Holland is still with the organization, but career, but fighting wise, she is, she is retired. I see. But she is at our North Plainfield uh, school and also she actually uh, judges during events in, in New Jersey. I should be doing that. Why aren't I doing that? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, hey, I'm sure, they're sure, I'm sure they would love to have you. I'm a good judge. Exactly. I usually get the scores correct. <laughs> Julio Arce as well. He too is a pro fighter as well. Uh, he is a former Ring of Combat Bantamweight champion. And uh, you should be on the lookout for him too. Oh, and also too, Shane Burgos. Forgot about him. I remember when I first started training, Joshu Rutherford really put over uh, Julio Arce. Like, look out for this guy. He's a beast. Yes. And I also remember taking several of Sensei Pace's grappling classes up at headquarters. So most of those people I was in the room with were those the amateurs and pros because I know Lyman Good was in the same class and this and that. Uh, yes. Uh, usually, if you're up there, really kind of any day except for Tuesday. Majority of the people in there are on the fight team, especially in the morning, because that's usually when the when the mm -hmm. that's usually when we train. I can't put over Sensei Pace's grappling class enough. I loved it so much; it was really good. Yeah, and he 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 definitely has knowledge for days. You trained with Uriah Hall as well. Yes, I did. Uh, when when Uriah was with us, uh, I was kind of one of the main people that was sparring with him. It was me. Usually, it was me, Lyman, and uh, at the time too, like. Uh, Steven Regman as well like we were kind of like the three guys that were all going with them like I'm not a big guy but I was a tall guy so I think that's why they always put me with him like those dudes are definitely weight classes above me right but I had the height so so they would have me work with them but I shouldn't say I enjoyed it because some days it sucked <laughs> but the thing is I always think to myself is like hey I trained with Lyman Good you know who's a former Bellator champion a former CFFC you know welterweight champion and 
these dudes hit hard. And my thing is like, if I can take a punch or a kick from them, then somebody in my same weight class, then I can definitely take a punch from them. No, no problem. For sure. Those, yeah. uh, especially those two guys you mentioned, Good and Hall, they are ripped. Yeah. And when I first started training, that's right when... Uh, Uriah Hall was starting on Ultimate Fighter. So, of course, that was all over Tiger Shulman's at the time because yep. of that spin kick knockout, which still gets replayed. Yep, it does. You didn't get hit with one of those, did you? Uh, Let me see. <laughs> oh. oh, you don't remember it? No, <laughs> no, I will tell you this. He definitely he, def he definitely would try to hit me with it. I'll tell you that one for sure. He, 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 lo he loved to throw his spinning kicks. So aside from Master Shulman himself, who are some of your other influences? You mentioned Bruce Lee before, and he's a big hero of mine. Do you take any aspects of his teachings? Do you see any maybe favorite fighter that you watch on pay-per-view or whatever and go, I'm going to try to take that little element, even if it's a foot movement, forget even if it's a spinning, flying kick and uh, flashy stuff, but even little details like that. Who are some of your other influences? Bruce Lee, like growing up as a, as a kid, he was the... He was the main guy. He was the, really the only guy. Like I even uh, got one of his books uh, a few years back. Uh, I, that was about his philosophies. You know, just reading it. You know, seeing the things that he would talk about, things he would say, and try to incorporate it. You know, in my in my daily life. He was a philosophy major, yeah. so he had a lot of great things to say and in interviews and books and his writings all over the place. Every every movie that he watched, like it was always something hidden in between like the movies like you just had to like pay attention to what the to really what the true story was about like it wasn't just about him kicking butt you know and, and taking names like there was a hidden message you know if, if you if you could find it don't look at the finger or you will miss all of that heavenly glory exactly <laughs> Not to cut you off, but I was thinking of Bruce Lee just recently when John Jones came back and fought um, OSP because People were saying how John Jones didn't look like his normal killer self. Obviously, he was trying to be a little cautious, not even just for the, quote, ring rust aspect, but mm -hmm. because I'm sure there were talks about, we want to put you against Cormier at 200 if we can, which, of course, it is now the main event. But he neutralized OSP so thoroughly with those leg kicks that he couldn't even get close to him. He did eat a couple shots here and there, but OSP really couldn't penetrate that defense and that's what i thought of immediately with bruce lee because his whole thing with jeet kune do was basically counter striking yes. striking before that can impact you and neutralizing your opponent's fists or feet that way did you think of bruce lee like i did when john jones fought last well no i mean when i saw john jones fighting i actually was just thinking that he was doing what he normally does which is he always tries to beat his opponents at their own game Mm -hmm. I really want to say like he has a strong mind, which is what Bruce Lee always talks about having. It's in the mind and going from there. Who are some of your favorite fighters to watch? Carlos Condit is one of them. I just love his style, everything that he's about, even as a person. Uh, of course, I like Cowboy Cerrone. These uh, are guys that go basically balls to the wall and you know you're going to get a great fight yes. every time they get in the cage and also too, like they're just good martial artists uh also too i like dominic cruz as i as i mentioned him before and then of course i like sugar rashad evans uh one, one, one of my favorite guys and then of course you know got to go back to the past uh older guys who are who are kind of semi-retired or retired you know you know the chuck liddell's tank uh, habit <laughs> Well, thank God, but not so much for me. Uh, but no, but like, I like, you know, Chuck Liddell. Uh, I like, you know, GSP. Those are really like the MMA guys. Roy Jones Jr., one of, one of my favorite ones. I just love the way how he moved, you know, his head movement. And also, too, he was just having fun when he, he was in the ring. Uh, Evander Holyfield. Another one, my another one, of my favorites. You know, I love I love to watch him him box as well. I think it's really telling that you didn't say Demetrius Johnson. <laughs> I, I mean, I am a fan of Demetrius Johnson, but you always get on my case about Mighty Mouse, <laughs> and you didn't even mention it now <laughs> because I it's not it's, Mighty Mouse isn't one of the guys who I look at 
in the combat world like that. Like, you asked me who's one of my favorites. Like, I'm a fan of his, but he's not, like, one of my favorite favorites, I guess, is what, is what I guess I'm trying to say. What, with how much UFC fighters put him over on TV about how great he is and he's the best pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world and I, mean, I love watching him and they're still not selling pay-per-views? Yeah. I mean, hey, he still does his thing. I was saying, I like Mighty Mouse. I'm a fan of his, but you asked me who are my favorites. I'm just giving you my favorites. Well, like, I'm, I'm a fan of his. Like, I'll pick him over Alexander Gustafson, but, you know, I still like Alexander Gustafson too, but, mm. you know, no knock on him but those are the people that came into i said to mess with you because every time you go you don't like flyweights eric and that's totally not true in fact i thought he was very impressive beating henry sahito like if there was any denying mighty mouse's credentials before definitely not now but i also mentioned it because you said dominic cruz before and i was at dominic cruz's last fight before his multi-year layoff when he fought, it was on the last UFC on Versus event, actually, from Washington, D.C., and he defended the Bantamweight title against Domin uh, against Demetrius. Demetrius Johnson. And for all this talk about how great Demetrius Johnson is, I guess at 125, they were just talking on Insiders about how he should go up to 135 again because there's nothing left for him to do. And I'm like, yeah, he's, he's really dominant in his weight class, maybe he cleared it out twice, like they said, but... When Dominic Cruz got in there with him, he tossed him around like a rag doll. He was all over him. Yep. I remember that match because that was actually a, a, a fight that I was looking forward to seeing because, like I said, I'm a fan of both of them. But I, I mean, at the course at the time, I was rooting for DC to do his thing, Dominic Cruz. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things was like Demetrius Johnson isn't really a big guy. Like, like he had some wins at, at Bantamweight. But, to put it yeah. lightly, you see him next to like even Ariel Hawani. It's like, oh my God, this guy is small. Yeah. <laughs> Ears are big, but the guy's small. I mean, that's how, yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how usually uh, the flyweights are. You know, they're not that tall of guys, you know, they're not that tall. You're currently still an instructor mm -hmm. at TSMMA. Were you a manager at some locations? I yes. can't keep track. I'm a Joshu, so I'm always going to be an, an instructor. Just depends on like the situation. Like I could be an assistant instructor or I could be the head instructor. I also manage uh, certain, some, some schools where, where I've gone to. Like when I was in Abington, Pennsylvania, I was the assistant instructor and manager there. When I was in Paramus, I was the assistant instructor and manager there. And at the Brick School, same thing. I was the assistant instructor and manager there. But like, of course, when I was in Middletown, where I first started, I was just assistant instructor. Like, I didn't manage because we already had a we already had a manager there and everything like that. And at what point did the fight game come into the conversation? Where did it go from? You're an instructor now. How did you start? amateur kickboxing i've always wanted to compete watching kickboxing watching mma watching boxing it's like man you know that's something that i would want to do it probably runs in my blood because my father was a professional boxer and so was my one, one of my older uh brothers as well they were both pro boxers so you know it probably just runs in the blood just being a video game head you know street fighter you know ryu you know ken i'm just Rue. like Rue, I don't care how many things Capcom puts out that says uh, Rue, uh, Ryu, Ryu, whatever. It's always been Rue to me, and I knew this from wrestling, because <laughs> Ten Rue in Katao came in from Japan for WrestleMania 7, and his name was spelt T-E-N-R-Y-U. So I just assumed when I saw the name Rue, it was Rue. But everyone's been telling me for decades, no, it's Ryu, no, it's Ryu, blah, blah, blah. And then when I was at Ring of Honor, we start working with uh, Pro Wrestling Noah, and two of the officials came over, Ken Hariyama, Ken and huh. Rue. Ken and Rue, R Y U. That's how it was spelled. So I wasn't wrong. Hey, for the I, record, hey everybody, everybody likes to be different with their names, you know. But hey, Rue, <laughs> Ryu, Ryu, like he was, he was my guy, of course, in that game. Mine too. Were you yeah. more of a Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat guy? Street Fighter. Awesome. Street Fighter. Street Fighter was first. Even like with Sagat, you know, because he was a Muay Thai fighter. So it would be like, oh, like you'd probably want to try that one day. I think just being around the the fight team you know and tiger showman's and just looking and i'm just like ah, you know man i could i could do that you know i could get in there and then i think just i remember exactly what it was because i think i wanted to get my second degree black belt first then i'll be like all right i'm ready to compete i'm ready to do this but i think one time i was having a talk with uh with a sensei actually sensei sensei carito to be exact 
and I and I told him this. And he just basically looked at me and he just said, there's no reason to wait because if you wait, it'll never happen. Okay, you know, might as well just do it now. So then that's when I think I found out that there was a fight coming up in Pennsylvania. I talked to uh, Sheon Simpson because he was when I was handling the, the fights in Pennsylvania. I told him, I was like, hey, you know, Sheon, I, I'd like to get on the next card. And he was like, okay, done deal. Boom, he got the fight. I had the fight and it's been history ever since. Was this Hamburg? Yes, Hamburg. Good old Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And what was the, the name of the venue? Because I remember I was there for uh, Joshua Rutherford's fight and you were in the main event and it was kind of like a, not a barn, but maybe it was a barn. Yeah, up it's, in- <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's called the Hamburg Field House. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a, just a field house. That's it. <laughs> and you went 11 and 6 amateur kickboxing and Muay Thai? Yes, I like I fought in Pennsylvania, I fought in New York, I fought in New Jersey. All different promotions? Yeah, all different promotions. Uh Pennsylvania was the USKA. Uh in New York, it was under the WKA and then in uh New Jersey. Actually, I think Warriors Cup is under is under the uh, WBC. And where does Combat at the Capital come into play? Uh they're the ones in New York. Uh they're under the uh the uh, WKA like all their belts that you see, it's all the WKA belts. I see. And when and how did you decide to go pro? Uh Cuz that was recent, correct? Yes, it was recent. Uh so it was one of those keeping up with with the Joneses type of deal. Cause I think what really what it was it was there were John two, Jones. Yeah, <laughs> there were there were two guys that I fought as an amateur, and I saw that they turned pro, and I was still of course fighting fighting amateur, and I'm just like, man, one guy I beat, the other guy, the the judges gave it gave it to him. So, but still, to me, it was still it was still a close fight. So in my head, I'm like, well, if these guys are doing it, then I can definitely do it. Right. So that was where it was kind of going more about, you know, all right, you know, let me turn pro. But then also, too, you got to think about if you were to make it a career, can you survive as a pro kickboxer? Because as everybody always says, you know, if you're doing combat sports, the real money is really only in boxing. You know, MMA is kind of going and kickboxing i think it depends on where on where you're at so i had a talk with um with my agent uh and i asked him i was like hey you know do you think i could make a career out of just being a pro kickboxer not going the route of doing pro mma you know not becoming an mma fighter he was like yeah you know you could you know it depends like you might do a lot of traveling which I don't mind because I've always wanted to see the world. We're here in the United States, but I know over in Europe, kickboxing is really big. Like, you know, you're going to like Latvia or the Netherlands, you know, Holland, stuff like that. Croatia. Yeah, exactly. You know, Croatia, even even France. Yeah, even yeah. France. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even France, even even um, Italy, England as well. You know, it's real big over there in Europe. That's something that we had talked about, and the wife over here, she's going to try to catch a plane ticket, too, because she wants to travel as well. <laughs> so she was kind of like, yeah, sure, if that's what you want to do, because, like I said, anywhere I go, she's trying to go with. Mm-hmm. And then I talked to my coaches. I think they wanted me to get one more fight in as an amateur. I had it. They liked the way how I looked, and they were like, okay, we can go pro now. So what's the difference between amateur and pro? Um, I'm guessing some rules and regulations. Uh, pay. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. We're getting paid now. No more. No. No more. No more. Just fighting for trophies or or medals. Uh, but also too, uh, the the minutes. You know, you're going from a two minute round to a three minute round. You might not think that that's a big difference, but it definitely is. Especially when you've got so much adrenaline pumping through yeah. your body and you got nerves and this and that, I presume. Yeah. So an, an, another minute can feel like an eternity. Yeah, exactly. And then also, too, there's some places where you can't maybe knee kick somebody in the face. But as a pro, you can. Right. Like as an amateur, you can't knee kick to the face. But as a pro, you can. You could throw round kicks to the head, no problem. But it was, it was I think, like knee kicks. Like you can knee kick somebody to the face. But as a pro, you can You've had one pro fight? Yes, I've had one pro fight so far. Hopefully, I'll have one again soon in the in the summertime. Uh, like I said, I last fought in February, and I wanted to kind of take some time off to kind of get myself ready for, for really what it means to, to be a, a pro. What happened in your first pro fight? <laughs> Man, it was a good experience. As the fans say, they loved it because 
that's one of the things I always try to be a, 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 a entertaining. crowd pleaser. Yes. Yeah. You know, I try, I try to bring fact, like, like how we talked about, you know, with like Carlos Condit and, and Cowboy Cerrone, they're bringing it. And that's what I usually try to do. Hats off to, to, to my opponent. He, he won the, he won the match, you know, the judges gave, gave it to him. Uh, you know, and by me rewatching the fight, you know, I could definitely see where where they could give it to him. But I definitely learned some things about myself that day, and I definitely learned some things about what it definitely takes to become a pro uh, a pro fighter. So, what are we looking at next? July, July thirtieth, to be exact. We'll see what happens. You were talking about Europe before and how big kickboxing is over there. And every time, especially on MMA Insiders, that kickboxing comes up, the discussion is why hasn't it taken off here? And I remember a few years ago because we've bumped into each other at a few Bellator's. Yes. I don't think you were at this one, but uh, my buddy Rodney and I. We went to a few and we ended up at the post-fight press conferences. And I remember asking Bjorn about, at the time, K1, mm-hmm. because Spike wanted to make their channel combat central in a sense. Yes. I think TNA was still there, but they were branching into kickboxing. And now, of course, they have that whole promo before their shows about it's the pbc See, yep. and bellator and uh now bellator kickboxing and this and that it's a nice video but that relationship with k1 didn't come to be and they ended up showing glory and with the dynamite show the other year and this and that glory they never seemed to fully commit to it yeah. in terms of promoting and do you think it's as simplistic as there just hasn't been a big American star. Uh, they constantly tout the high knockout rate and this and that. And you would think it would take off because of that, because of the added element, not just of traditional boxing, but with the knees and kicks and this and that. But when people look at grappling, you st- I'm sure you still hear this a lot. When a fight goes to the ground, there's still that perception out there that it's just two guys rolling around on top of each other. Yep. And that comes from a perspective of ignorance. They have no idea what they're looking at. They don't know the, the minute details and the finesse of the art involved. This human game of chess, as Larry Zabisco used to say. Yeah. But it really is. And it's so deep and complex. That's what I love about grappling so much. But that's coming from more of a let's say educated perspective which is why when i love when someone does a great counter gets a mount or whatever and the crowd pops and they say an educated crowd here in brazil or whatever it is which was the complete opposite of back in the day so with that perception of grappling you would think kickboxing would appeal more to an audience like that but hasn't really taken off in the u.s especially compared to europe so why do you think that is kickboxing is a big sport you know but think about this so is soccer Soccer is supposed to be the world's biggest sport, but is it big in the U.S.? No, it's big over in other in other countries, and I think it's the same thing because there isn't no big U.S. star. Like, yes, people rally around Team USA, the men's USA soccer team, but they only do it every four years. It's not like they're following those guys right. and seeing what they're doing for like Major League Soccer or if they're playing over in like Europe for like Manchester United or anything like that, you know, they're not following them that way, but everybody gets big on the, on the world cup. But that, again, that's every four years. It's the same thing with like the, uh, the uh, Olympics. Those people aren't watching swimming all the time. They're not watching fencing all the time, you know, or gymnastics. They're only watching because, Oh, Hey, it's the Olympics. Let me root for my country. You have to have that person that you can relate to for instance, like boxing. You had Floyd Mayweather. He's an American. Roy Jones Jr. He was American. Uh, Vander Holyfield, Muhammad Ali, Americans. That's why Americans be like, oh, I like boxing. But Anderson Silva became one of the biggest draws in MMA, not being an American and not speaking English on TV True, very much. But that took him a long time. Sure. It's not like it was, oh, as soon as he's gone, he came on, people of loved course him. Not, it, yeah. took, it, took him, it took him many, many fights. Like It didn't take him until, I really want to say... Maybe the second Franklin fight, I think that's when people were like, all right, this guy might be legit. And then they had to keep watching him just do it over and over. He was being sold to them. Like, they they were promoting him. And kickboxing, for instance, like with Glory and Spike, let's see, there there really wasn't ever any promotion for them on Spike. You look at Spike, all you're seeing is, is, is cops over right. and over and over. And they put them on at odd hours exactly. of the night. You know, and then, you know, seeing like they weren't showing the, the same time or anything like that. And kickboxing is not like they're getting radio time you know they're not on you know the mma hour they're not on these other podcasts or anything like that like 
like MMA fighters are, you know, or, or boxers are, you know, they're not on ESPN, they're not on Fox Sports, you know. Um, so I think that's one of the things too, is like, you know, one, they are not getting promoted, but plus two, you need that person that you can get behind. I got behind Gokan Saki. Just because I thought he had the coolest name. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I, like Nikki Holskin. Everybody likes him. You know, he's he's from Holland. He can speak English. But the thing is, though, are you going to start pushing him? Like, we got to see him more on a regular basis, get him get him over. You know, it's the same thing like, like a GSP. Like, GSP is big in Canada, but he's also big in the USA as well. Right. Why? Because you see him. Because he's white and speaks English? <laughs> Give me that, too. I mean, hey, I mean, hey you look at Nikki Halsgen. He's white, speak, speaking English, too. And also, too, I think I think I was telling I was just telling somebody on Twitter because they were saying, like, oh, when is uh, uh, Nikki Halsgen fighting again? And I was like, oh, I think he's going to be fighting in September because they're going to be in Vegas. And he has some ties in Vegas because he hangs out, I think, at the Mayweather Boxing Gym. So that's a guy who's in Vegas where they're going to try to promote him there. So you get him on, on, the, on the state side. So he could be that guy, even though he's not an American, but you can still follow him and you see his fights and you just, and you just keep growing with him. And I'm kidding about the white thing. Pacquiao <laughs> yeah. Mayweather did the biggest yeah. buy rate ever and neither one of them are white. But I'm just saying what I meant about Anderson Silva, for instance. Yes, it did take time for him to build his name just like Fedor uh, here in the U.S., but that came about like John Jones is one of the big draws now for UFC. And that came from a body of work, so to speak. That came from many fights with many dominant victories, with many knockouts, many submissions, et cetera, et cetera. D is that what it's going to take for an English speaking kickboxer to have a body of work, like a highlight reel of knockouts that they could show on ESPN? No, I, I mean, I don't really think so. Like, for instance, like, to me, Glory was trying to use Joe Schilling as that guy. Like, he got that big fight uh, against Artem Levin, beat him, which was big news. But to me, Glory's hands were tied, where it's not like they had an outlet to post it to. It's not like they can say, oh, hey, ESPN showed this. Oh, hey, you know, Fox Sports showed this. Or, or you know, or send, or send him on 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 any any like radio shows or anything to to like talk about it like i think they were trying to use him as that guy but then he was like all right i'm gonna do bellator mma now you know i'm gonna i'm gonna venture into mixed martial arts and and everything like that but i think like they are trying to grow themselves with some american talent like you look at uh, a dustin jacoby you know he's an american country boy, you know, from Colorado, you know, he's basically a blue collar type of guy, which most Americans can get behind because that's really how majority of Americans are. And, uh, you know, and I think they're trying to use him as, cause he's somebody who, who I see them sending him to like NBC, or I think this, uh, I think soon they're going to be on ESPN. Like they're going to be on sports center now, you know? So I think he's a guy that they're going to push. And of course, like he's fighting like, you know, he fought Simon Marcus and everything like that. He's a Canadian, but he speaks English, you know. So it's like those are guys who speak English that people can follow and they can dig their fighting styles because they both bring it, you know. And so those are fighters that people like. You need an it factor, I think. Like yes. Mayweather has a character. People complain constantly after his fights. Oh, this fight sucked. I'm never ordering one again. And yet he keeps doing bigger numbers, usually uh, time after time uh, until he retired. Conor McGregor, same thing. A talker, a character talks people into the building. Anderson Silva being a draw is not like that in either way. His gimmick, so to speak, his draw was his fighting. Yeah. And as long as you have something to draw eyes onto the screen, that's what's going to bring it. Whether it's your gender, like Ronda Rousey being a dominant female, Anderson Silva just knocking people out, dancing left and right, this and that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing, I think. But along those lines, do you think Glory missed an opportunity to get eyes on their product with not having Goldberg fight? Uh, <laughs> now, for those who don't yeah. know, Bill Goldberg is a huge kickboxing fan, obviously former WCW and WWE champion. Uh, well, it was the WCW belt in WWE, but same difference. Yeah. And he started doing promotional work for Glory, commentating this and that, because he's a big combat sports fan. He owns a Muay Thai gym. Apparently, he was in talks with Glory to have a, I guess, quote, exhibition fight or something like that. And the idea was to 
use his name value to get eyes on the product. And in fact, one point, I think the rumor was him versus Alberto Del Rio <laughs> when mm-hmm. he was uh, not in WWE. But that didn't come to be. And as you were talking about getting attention to uh, some of these fighters, and they're not on Good Morning America, they're not yeah. on Sports Center, this and that. Well, WWF obviously did the same effect with the rock and wrestling connection in the 80s and Mike Tyson in the 90s. Get a mainstream name to your show so you can show the rest of the audience who tunes in because of that. Hey, look, here's what we're all about. Bellator doing the same thing with their freak show fights like Kimbo and Ken and then Kimbo and Dada. That was talked about on MMA Insiders a lot, how the uh, preceding shows after that uh, did some higher numbers to a lessening wave week after week, but still it was higher than average. So do you think that they missed the boat with Goldberg? Would it take something like that? No, because they were still using him. Like, I think he was, he, I think he, he was one, he was a backstage reporter for them. So his name was there. Like they were still using his name as he was working with them. Then also too, I think he was, uh, he was an in ring interviewer for them as well. Like yeah, he, but he would get th- there's in the a ring. big difference between that and Goldberg's going to have a kickboxing fight. True. I mean, that is true. But then also too, you got to think about with belt, like you brought up Bellator. Now, before they were doing the fights, they were doing what they call their fan fest. So right. you so you would get a Hoist Gracie showing up. Wanderlei. You know, yeah, you yeah. know, like those guys, even a Fedor, you right. know, like that's using their names, but they're not fighting. They're just hanging out, signing autographs, taking pictures with you, which is why I think Glory was really kind of doing the same thing with Goldberg's like, hey, Bill Goldberg's going to be here. You know, why don't you guys come come check it out? Yeah, but Bellator put Tito and Stefan Bonner in the main event of their show and did the biggest number to date from that. So I'm saying, don't you think it would need something like that, not just Goldberg holding a microphone? They did big numbers without that. Like, I think... Um, like, if they did Jean-Claude Van Damme against somebody, you don't think that would do a huge number? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure people would, I'm sure people would tune in. Like, say, like, people, people like the, like, they like the weird stuff, as I guess you want to say, or the, or the freak fights, you right. know, but Glory was trying to do it like, a legit sport you know like saying like you bring the person in use them in a different way but they don't have to get in the ring but then also too i want to say i think when goldberg was with them i think they might have been under different um ownership because i don't think john franklin who's now their ceo uh i don't think he was on board like or should I say he wasn't at his level that he is now so maybe it could have been different with when they were changing things because i know before when they were first on spike they were doing real good numbers like i think glory 13 think was like their highest thing or their highest fight and i think of course who was on it nikki holtskin so which is why i think they, they were really trying to pump nikki holtskin as the really the, the big star could the next big star for glory be joshu brandon catino uh, yeah it definitely could be man if uh they they come they come hollering at me man you know the mechanic is is always ready to uh to uh, do work where can we follow the mechanic on social media twitter uh, at B Catino, that's C U T T I N O, uh, T S M M A. So it's at B Catino, T S M M A. Uh, that's Twitter. And then on Facebook, it's just uh, Brandon the Mechanic Catino. Those are really the two uh, best ways. If you really want to know what's going on in my fighting career, just follow the Facebook. But if you really want to know what's going on in like every day and like my thoughts on like sporting events or anything like that, Twitter's the best way. This guy tweets more than anybody I think I know personally. <laughs> hey, got to get out there to, to the people. You know, people ask me questions, so sometimes I respond. No, of course, that's yeah. great. And I hope we see you fighting in glory sooner rather than later. And your next fight, July 30th. 30th. Good luck, Joshu. Thank you. Oos. Oos. Oos is spelt O-S-U, not spelt how it sounds, but if you are into martial arts at all, I'm sure you've heard that word. We use it all the time. In fact, it's so ingrained in me, like the military, that I don't feel comfortable not addressing someone who I train with, especially higher rank than me, without the oos. And that's just basically an affirmation or a confirmation that, yes, I acknowledge you. I heard that. Yes. Oos. As the mechanic mentioned, his next fight is Saturday, July 30th at USKA Fight Night. It's at the O'Connell Lodge in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He will be in the middleweight super fight versus Jovan Davis. 
Tickets are available at uskafights.com. And if you want to support Joshu, if you're going to the event that night, his t-shirt is exclusively available now on tigear.com slash Catino. That's T-I-G-E-A-R.com slash Catino. And hurry because the deadline is Wednesday, July 6th. Good luck to the mechanic, Brandon Catino. Next week, my guest will be the American psycho, Alex Payne, independent wrestler, former wrestling roundtable panelist, and one of my best friends. Sorry, it's not Christian Bale, American psycho. Oh, good for you! And how was it? But the American psycho nonetheless. You've seen plenty of his matches on the Wrestling Roundtable YouTube account, and we will find out more about him next week. Follow the podcast on Twitter at a few words with ES. Give the podcast a like on Facebook, a good review on iTunes. Subscribe there as well. You can download on SoundCloud any feedback, afwpod at gmail.com. Send an email. Playing us out is the track Seventh Sense from Lawrence Haber's album Anxiety Log, available on iTunes, Spotify, CD Baby, Amazon, Google Play, and more. Follow him on Instagram at Lawrence Haber Music. Enjoy and have a great week.